Hello. Hi there. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Alana Glazer, and I'm a comedian and also a co-founder of Generator Collective. Um, yeah, so wow, I am super excited to be kicking off the first night and the first event of the first ever digital version of the Pygmalion Festival. It's weird, you know, I was like, wasn't sure if I was gonna like see a um, audience, but it's like, there's no audience to see. It's just us, you and me in our homes. So strange. Um, I just first wanna say thank you to Seth and Vanessa and Ryan and everyone on the Pygmalion team for making this happen. Um, damn, I was just talking to Vanessa and Ryan who are producing this tonight and it's, and, and they usually produce the, <laughs> the live festival. It's such a, strange thing um this year how we've all i mean it's it's our resilient you know whatever resilience is amazing how we can just pivot and make it work um but you know for as like as new and kind of strange as as it can feel it's like i'm heartened by the fact that people just want to connect you know like whether it's uh irl or digital that's the most important thing is that we connect and um, humans connecting with each other. So thank you for joining me. Um, and it's just nice to be connected. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about Generator because I imagine if you uh, came here, um, you like know about Broad City and my comedy and I am um, a comedian and I miss laughs. <laughs> I miss comedy. Um, but uh, in the past four years, I've been doing some advocacy and organizing with my group Generator. Um, so Generator was founded in 2016 by my co-founder, Glennis Mahar, and myself to gather and talk about politics and government without feeling foolish. The system makes you, it tries to make you feel foolish. Oh, you don't know how it works. You don't know everything of how it works so that we, the people, feel um, sort of intimidated or ashamed out of making the system work for us. And that's kind of why we want to gather and talk about it is because it's like, you know, I don't need to know every detail of or, or you know, um, I don't know, of policy or something, but like the, the feelings that we have and the way that we want to live our lives, that's policy and that's government. And that's, um, that's the way the system should serve us to make our lives better. Um, so we are all about humanizing policy, and we want to define minimal civic engagement and embody that. Um, you know, in this, in our country, it's like people are either fighting for their lives or they don't have, you know, any connection to civic engagement. So we're kind of just trying to raise the bar like an inch off the floor and invite everyone, specifically Gen Z and millennials, to have a new standard for what civic engagement looks like. Um, so Generator is uh, multitudinous, not to brag, not to brag just about my vocabulary and uh, also um, that we are layered, okay, and nuanced and layered. But um, we have a few branches of how we exist. One is as an online movement. Um, we have a simple format to use on Instagram stories just to make it easier for people to use their platform to talk about government and politics. We all have these platforms now. so you know, yes, bikini pick, yes, thotty pick, but also once in a while, let's hear what you think about the system. Let's hear what your issue is with the system. Um, I'm gonna tell you quick, the format is you just say on Instagram stories, your name, I'll do it with a phone, no, no miming, your name, your location, one thing you love, and one issue you have with the system. I'm sure you have more than one, but just one issue you have with the system. You tag Generator Collective, we repost you on stories, and then we hashtag, your issue to the policy that it correlates to, thus humanizing policy in real time. Um, and then we have two IRL components that we've um, pivoted both to COVID safe online versions of. Um, Generator Live, which is an interview series. I interview politicians and activists to investigate the system at a Homer Simpson level. They're the experts and the politicians and activists that I interview kind of hinge from one to the other. And we have these Jenny Socials, voter empowerment dance parties, where we dance for 10 or 15 minutes at a time and then interrupt to have the experts, politicians and activists come on and give us um, like a cheat sheet for the upcoming uh, ballot uh, for the election. 
So this election cycle, um, we are uh, really thinking that minimal civic engagement is making sure that you have a voting plan and that you commit to voting and that you vote for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris um, and do some research about the Democrats and progressives up and down the ballot. Um, we had this tour in March called Horny for the Polls, LOL. Uh, P O L L S. So you could come to my stand up show. It was it was a half stand up, half Jenny social tour. So one night, every city I stayed two nights. And at my stand up shows, you could register to vote with this great organization headcount. And then at our Jenny socials, we were creating these cheat sheets for the upcoming elections. And at that time, it was for the upcoming primaries in each city. Um, so then obviously, COVID happened. So we created this series called Cheat Sheet for the Voting Booth. Um, I'm interviewing uh, celebrities, activists, artists, musicians, athletes who have authentic connections to swing states, Arizona, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, Georgia, North Carolina. Um, whether it's that they grew up there, they went to college there, or they play for a sports team there or whatever, um, or they filmed there for you know many years. Um, I interview them, ask how they feel about the state. We talk top ballot about Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. And um, then we go down the ballot to create a cheat sheet for the voting booth in these progressive, um, in these swing states, hopefully progressive. So uh, you can check that out at cheat sheet for the voting booth.com. And there's these tools right up when you land on the page. There's great content. It's really like fun, light and educational, um, but you can get registered to vote at cheat sheet for the voting booth.com. And there's this great tool where you step out a voting plan. It like helps you click through and think out your, your visualize your plan for voting because um, it's not easy. It should be a national holiday. We should all just show up and it's, we should be registered automatically, whatever it, it's, it's made hard. So uh, one thing I just want to like repeat tonight is make a plan, talk it out. And if you can go with a friend, that's dope. Cause like, you just don't know what you're going to come up, um, up against. So um the importance of down ballot elections uh, cannot be stressed enough. You know, um, presidential, it's like, okay, like Joe Biden, are we gonna like shake Joe Biden's hand ever? You know what I mean? It's like, I'll never meet him. He's, you know, it's like a far away thing. And like, listen, I'm really, I'm, I'm voting for Joe Biden because uh, I really miss human decency and um, science, belief in science. But, you know, it's broad, you know, compared to local city and state reps that those representatives, those candidates are doing like the most detailed, specific work specifically aimed at your life, your day to day life. Um, people that sometimes, you know, you don't even know the offices, uh, like the attorney general, like in, in the past few years, I was like, New York has an attorney general. Yeah. Um, your coroner's office. Did you know that you have a coroner's office? So you will learn very much about that tonight. So that's where you see in these local elections, local city and state is really where you see policy impact your community most immediately. So tonight I'm really excited um, about the guests that I have. And uh, it's, it's just like, it brings um, hope in such this like sort of doom and gloom conversation that keeps being thrust upon us about this election. Man, tonight's uh, conversations are going to give you hope. Um, I'm interviewing uh, Chandra Bishop, running for uh, Champaign County Coroner, Marie Newman, who's running for US, uh, a U.S. House seat for District 3 in Illinois, and Abby McKenty, who is representing one of our favorite organizations, activist organizations, Indivisible. So um, our first guest is Chandra Bishop. Um, let me just intro her before I bring her on and also ask my husband to get me a glass of water. Baby, hey, can you just get me a glass of water? <laughs> I, I can't tell, you know what I mean? It's not like I'm hearing the last or whatever. Okay, so let me just intro Chandra Bishop um, while I get moisture for my mouth um, before I bring her on. So Chandra Bishop is running for Champaign County Corner. I really am so excited to, uh, to learn about her and meet her tonight and talk talk with her. She has been a public health professional and community leader for the last six years, working in government organizations and the nonprofit world. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. So I learned about amazing Chandra from Run for Something, which is a phenomenal organization that uh, 
helps, empowers, and trains 25 to 40 year olds to run for something. Um, so before I knew about Chandra's campaign, I gotta be honest, I didn't really know about the coroner's office. Um, and what I have learned about it in the way that Chandra's reimagining it is so cool and I'm so excited to share with you. Um, so yeah, let's bring on Chandra Bishop running for Champaign County Coroner. Hello. Hi, hi Chandra. How are you? I'm doing good. It's so nice to see you. You too, you too. This is what we have in this day and age. Nice to see it's, you. Yeah, it's so, it's so weird. It's so <laughs> strange. Um, but it's cool. It really is like still a relief, like you st just to be able to connect. So um, I'm so grateful for it. Um, before we get into like the meat and potatoes of this, just how's your day going? Actually, it wasn't too bad. Um, it, we're very close to Friday, so you know, yeah, <laughs> that's a plus. And yeah. the, I went to the dentist, and I don't have any cavities, so that's great. Yes, yes. Celebrate with ice cream. Yeah, that's right. And also, speaking of like county coroner teeth, are like such like a morbid thing. Where like I don't know, it makes me feel my age or whatever. So that's really nice that you're just like sort of the same mouth as a year ago. You know, that's excellent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. So, okay, let me talk about like the little bit that I know about the coroner's office and then we'll sort of get into how you're seeing it and seeing representing it in a new way. Um, okay. So a typical coroner's office, as I understand, does three things. Investigates deaths, issues cremation permits, death certificates, and sort of like the paperwork of death, mm -hmm. you know, um, and talks with families who have lost a loved one to help them figure out kind of what to do with that loved one once they pass away, help them complete the, the process. Um, is that correct? Yes, yes. Um, so first of all, I'm wondering, what's the difference between a coroner and a medical examiner? So a medical examiner is a doctor, essentially, a pathologist um, who has that medical degree, that medical background, whereas a coroner um, may not have that degree that that medical knowledge, but is uh, and coroners usually contract out, out with pathologists to do autopsies and that sort of thing. Got you. Right. So like a coroner, it's not it's not the medical thing. It's more like the um, legal, the administrative, and also like you know if you can get it in there, the sort of ritual and community aspect of death. Right. Right. The investigation, the um, collecting of the evidence and, and that sort of thing to determine how this person died and was it suspicious and, and that sort of thing. Wow. Um, you say that you want to help demystify the coroner's office. What does that mean to you and how would you do that? So uh, when a lot of people think about the coroner's office, they think, you know, death and dark and you know that right. sort of thing i, I want to make it so that it's it's not that all the time um i want to offer outreach programs that offer insight into the role of the coroner and how its functions impact our community so in addition i want to improve access for people to find information on the investigations into the deaths of their loved ones um, as well as offer resources they may need to grieve um, whether that be like you said, um, finding the next, you know, place for their loved one, um, you know, support or counseling they may need if it was a traumatic event, you know, things like that. So this elected position mm. should engage with the community more and not just in the cases of trauma and bereavement. Um, the coroner should be able to focus on determining the cause of death as well as help to prevent unnecessary deaths. So when your coroner is active in the community and focused on keeping people alive, um, you can trust her with the important work of investigating death in our in the community. Wow, that's really interesting. I didn't, um, yeah, like I wouldn't, I guess I like haven't thought of like the sort of the unanswered questions that a coroner's office can really help sew up. Mm -hmm. um, and this kind of relates to me, or, or I, I think it's relating to this, how you talk about data collection. Mm -hmm. um, how, did, how did we say this here? Yeah, but that, that's like one of the things as you see the coroner's office, how you reimagine it, um, 
fighting for better data collection in office? Like, what does the typical data collection look like? And what's the sort of, um, what's the expanded better version that you're seeing and are going to be able to serve? So I want to see more um, availability of the data for our community. So essentially, um, when the coroner compiles like yearly statistics, I would love to see that report available to the community because with that data we can justify why such programs um, or organizations need funding say for suicide prevention if we have an uptick in, in suicides in our county wouldn't it be helpful for the community to know okay um 18 to 24 year olds we're seeing you know three more than we did in the previous years and so we need programming to target that age group and so so having that data be readily available to our community could potentially prevent, you know, further mortalities in that area. Um, and so I and also want that information wow. to be available for like state and national databases so that um, we can be included in, in any sort of like, you know, funding that comes from, you know, the state right. governments. So Chandra, is it, um, is this data like, is it specifically kept, you know, is it secret? Like how do people access it? You know, you have the knowledge to access it, to even ask mm -hmm. for it. Like what's the um, typical handling of this data? Just like, yeah. So Go ahead, sorry. I think, I don't think most of the times when people are looking for data and want access to it, they go to the internet, right? They like Google it. But I think that um, in the case of um, act, local data, it's difficult to get to if the um, elected office is not making it readily available. So if, for instance, I've heard a story about someone looking to access data and they had to jump through all of these hoops filling out a Freedom of Information Act um, paperwork, I don't think it should be that difficult um, to access data that should be readily, um, that's, it's not private data, it's not. It's collected based on the community's experience. Exactly. It should be for the community to, like, you know, now that you say it and like bring it up, I'm like, I can't imagine what, I mean, what my Brooklyn coroner's office or whatever. And it's like, can I see this data? And they'd be like, who are you? Right. You know, exactly. but it's like, why do you need it? You right. Know? And like, you know, to be honest, it's like you're, you've been doing this work for six years. You're educated enough to actually make sense of that research, but how that is amazing how to imagine a city coroner offering it in a way that is, that grows upon itself. And I mean, if it's just um, an annual report featured on the website that gives us right. statistics, that's, that's simply all I think that people would like to see, just to see um, the health of the community. So let's let's say like I'm envisioning you, you win this election, you are Champaign County Coroner. You gather this data. Would you then, you know, call your elected officials to implement these ideas you have about like funding and, you know, resources? Like, is that how you would? So I imagine it being a coordinated partnership with other community organizations. Like I work in public health now and we offer programs and um, initiatives that target um, different, you know, preventable diseases and conditions and that sort of thing. So why not use that data from the coroner's office to say, okay, public health, we saw um, 54 people die of heart disease in our county last year what can we do um, more specifically to limit those deaths or those types of deaths? Um, we can, we have a, an entity that focuses on healthy eating and pushing, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables. Maybe we need to target um, this population a little more, start young in the schools, that sort of thing, just a mm -hmm. collaborative effort. My ideas don't necessarily cost a lot of money. Right. It's just, using leveraging our resources a little bit more efficiently right it's i mean because you're just seeing it as this public health an extension of public health the coroner's office mm -hmm. um it can actually be pivoted toward public health if someone fr with your background in public right. health knows how to pivot that sort of 
flow that's already happening. You're just sort of like moving it over there or like widening the stream to encompass this role. Exactly. And bringing more people in, making it um, a community focused office. Right. Yeah. Like, you know, I, it's, people are afraid to talk about that. You know, I've been like trying to work on like my plans or whatever for a <laughs> while. And I'm just like, it's so, I, I'm more avoidant than I really ah, knew and understood. Like, how do you make, how do you open up this conversation about death? And also like our country, it's like, we're so religious and yet we're so atheist and we are, you know, it's like, there's just no, um, there's no sort of like common ground <laughs> for it. So how would you, how do you see ha engaging the community in the coroner's office? Well, I mean, just really thinking outside the box um, about how to, as you say, like bring people's mindset to um, think about death, not so morbidly. It's okay to talk about it. It doesn't mean you're going to die in three minutes, you know? Right. Um, oh. And especially making sure that um, your family or your friends know your end of life wishes. There's, there are so many times um, people are taken from us and we have no idea what their wishes would be. Right. And so I envision also having the opportunity to um, bring, you know, some sort of initiative to the community where we are talking about how to create a living will or how to create a will or, um, what your end of life wishes may be, whether the, whether you want to be an organ and tissue donor. And that's another um, initiative I think could be very beneficial from the coroner's office. Telling people the importance of being an organ and tissue donor. I mean, how many lives can be saved just through that? And, and the fact that it's not this, um, this like back alley butcher shoppy thing, mm. it's really saving lives right. by being an organ donor. And I just think people need the education and knowledge behind it. Some, some people just simply don't think about it. So I, I just want to be able to be another voice in our community saying these things. Because also like when you're saying it, I'm just like, okay, okay, it's hard, but it's like, okay, you talk about it. You know, like just to open that conversation um, <sighs> makes it so much more possible and, and, and so much less scary. Um, <laughs> And if you pull in, like, you know, if, if it's a thing that both, you know, a household does together, you know, it's, it's less, scary. Right. I'd rather be, how scary is it to prepare than to be unprepared? You know what I mean? That's like, right. What, That's right. It's, it's way more scary to be unprepared. Like you go and what's your family left with? Like they're, they're not right. And to make it easier for the people you leave behind, because it's already a huge emotional toll. Like, right. Don't have them running around trying to figure out what you would have wanted. Oh, oh my gosh. You're like really talking me into it. Yeah. Just like sort of grow <laughs> up, like look at it and you know, everybody dies. <laughs> so like you can yeah. kind of prepare for the people around you better. That's right. And Chandra, you've um, consistently advocated for underserved communities through your public health work and your education work. Um, in a, in the situation, in the instance of a coroner's office, what does, you know, what does an underserved community look like? Or what does an underserved community's coroner's office look like compared to like a wealthy community's coroner's office? Like how, how does income and, and racial inequality express itself through this, this part of the system is my question. Mm -hmm. um, making sure that people have the resources they need to um, say those final goodbyes. I think it's important um, connecting them to say that someone um, who can afford a funeral passes, can we connect them to some resources that could help them with cremation or burial? Um, because I mean, just to give right. them the dignity of a funeral, um, even if they can't afford it. Right, you know? right. So just, just simply like that. And then also, um, having the, the courage and the audacity to um, fight for the truth to come out in deaths that are suspicious um, for whatever reason, homicide, suicide, whatever, just making sure that there is truth autonomous of politics. Um, that, is, that is so 
you know, just the thing of the, uh, of like a burial and a funeral being paid for by the community is uh, radical. It shouldn't be so radical, but that is, uh, wow, I'm blown away by that. Like I never thought of the community paying for it, but it is so, that is so crazy that that's folded into capitalism, like how you get to appreciate someone's death. I mean, it's like, it's so ubiquitous that I didn't think of it as uh, any other way, but there it is. Yeah, I mean, and and not just the community paying for it, essentially, but like having the resources available, it, it maybe establishing some sort of, you know, fund or something out of the coroner's office where people can donate to it and and subsequently help those with burial. Well, also, Chandra, the way you say it, it's like, it's not like this stuff is expensive. If there was like some sort of just system set up for it, it would, mm-hmm. it could totally be limited. It's not like, you know, we act as though, you know, everything costs what it does, but it could just be folded sort of into the system where there's at least a um, baseline mm-hmm. to work off of for people. And I mean, and this is just simply why I'm running because right. no one has explored these ideas. Um, it, I mean, it, and it's like, do- you know, it's, it's about like the conversation and the imagination. It starts with the, with, with this, you know, it's not like it could be implemented right away, but it makes right. so much sense, you know, and you have this experience to, to implement it and to set up those like sort of tentpole stakes. Um, that's amazing. That's so, uh, this is so um, illuminating. Thank you so much for Absolutely. joining me tonight. Um, my final question for you, Chandra, is that I'm wondering how people watching tonight can support you and your campaign. Um, share my Facebook page, um, Chandra Bishop for Champaign County Corner. Um, visit my website to sign up for a phone bank, which can be done from anywhere. Um, and that's how we're reaching voters this year. So phone banking um, and, and just reaching out digitally to people. Um, and of course, I'm running a grassroots campaign fueled by small donors. Um, so another way to help would be making a donation so that I can continue to get my message out um, and finish this campaign strong. And so to make a donation, you can go to votechandra.com. Um, and this is a progressive, forward-thinking campaign based on community. And I would love your all support. So again, please join me at votechandra.com. And Chandra, um, just want to spell it for people, C-H-A-U-N-D-R-A. That's correct, yes. Votechandra.com. <laughs> yeah, so so beautiful. Thank you so much, Chandra. Such a pleasure talking to you, and thank you for expanding my mind the way you did tonight. I appreciate thank it. Thank you for giving us this platform to talk about the importance of local elections. Thank you. I appreciate this. My pleasure and my honor. Thank you, Chandra. Have a good night. You too. Wow, dude, I love Generator because I learn so much <laughs> about um, the way the world works. I mean, really, it's like the system is just, uh, if you could reimagine it, it's like it could just be so much better and serve the community um, in a real way. And also women rule. Um, and to, to keep with that, how um, women leaders rule. And also, I, I don't even mean to be binary about it, but I just love it. Um, I just love women leaders. Um, speaking of which, my next guest, uh, I'm just like talking to the producers not to brag, you guys. I'll do this intro first and then um, you can bring Marie on in a second. So my next guest is Marie Newman. Um, as I'm sure a lot of you um, who are probably uh, from the Illinois area watching are probably aware, but I'm just learning about her um, in the past couple weeks and I'm so excited to learn about her just like Chandra. Um, Marie Newman ran in 2018 against an incumbent whose family had been holding Illinois' third district for like almost 40 years. I'm like, family? Like, it, it's just so weird in politics how like a family can take over office. It's just bizarre to me. Um, so in 2018, uh, Marie ran against this race and lost this race. She lost against this dude. He was one of the most conservative Democrats in Congress. Bizarre to see his policies and be like, why are you even a Democrat? Um, So Marie ran against him in 2018 and she lost by very tight, very narrow margins. So Marie does not get got. She has not gotten down by this. She says, okay, cool. I'm just gonna run again in 2020. So guess what? Marie Newman 
won her primary against this incumbent. He had been in the seat 15 years before his like family had it for decades. So she won her primary, won her primary against uh, whatever, this dude in this family for Illinois' third district. So now Marie is in the seat in uh, Illinois 3 to run against this Republican. She is supported by all of the faves of the progressive movement. Seriously, Senator Elizabeth Warren, Senator Bernie Sanders, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Hello. Okay, I hear that if Newman is elected, she's legit going to be in the squad, okay? So um, Marie is running on a platform of addressing everybody's every day oh, and is advocating for progressive causes to drive innovation and invest in people. She wants to build infrastructure, mass transportation, jobs, and grow a green economy. Pairs the need for jobs with the need for a green economy. So give it up. Clap in your homes alone for Marie Newman. Woo! Just waiting for her to come on. I should have done this for Shonda too. Yes! Oh, good are you there? Hey, there you are. Hi, Marie. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. I really appreciate it. Pleasure. And thank you for running. I know um, you say like you had to run. You didn't want to run. You had to run. But um, still, thank you. I mean, yeah, thank you for doing what you had to do. That's right. We all have to do something, right? And that's my job. Yeah, that's right. So before we get into sort of the meat and potatoes of everything, just wondering how, how's your day going? You know what? I had... So I was knocking doors for a couple hours with one of my um, good pals, one of my staffers. And uh, the, there's good and bad about doors, mostly good. Like I've never really had a bad door, honestly. Like I've never had anyone slam it in my face. Mm. Or, you know, like honestly, people are generally respectful. Um, cool. but I sort of love tonight because a lot of people were what I would call good old fashioned, but honest. And they said, Honestly, honey, if, if you were a bobblehead and you were a Democrat, I would vote for you just because we got to get that guy out. <laughs> so. Amazing. Yes. Amazing. I, I'm like, my job is done. <laughs> That's great. Oh, I'm so glad. And you well, can like maybe Thursday, so yeah. sleep well right. tonight. Too. It has been a long week month, so I'm having a little wine. Yeah. <laughs> good. That's good. Um, so it's, it's interesting that you won um, your primary, that what changed from 2018, that you lost this, prim this um, primary in 2018, and then in 2020, you won it from this incumbent years and decades and all this. Um, right. So I'm wondering, what do you think changed from 2018 to 2020 in your district, Illinois' third district? Yeah, you know, I think that it wasn't just one thing, right? Is that um, I learned a lot because we made mistakes, right? I I became a better candidate. I understood mm. the district better. Um, I learned the importance of voter outreach and uh, having a field team. Um, I invested in all of those things. I started very early. I didn't let my opponent own my message for even a half of a day. We were in front of him all day long and twice on Sundays all day long. And um, and we started fundraising really early um, and we got all of the progressive groups uh, on board. Oh gosh. Uh, in May. Wow. So really just everything was early. Yeah. Just oh, cool. earlier. Cool. And like, which also when you say you became a better candidate and messaging, um, was it like chops? Was it like sort of the crafting of your political narrative? You just had the chops and had gone through something to then yeah. edit. I think every, I mean, every candidate gets better as they go along, but I also learned um, what, what you should worry about and what you shouldn't worry about, you know, mm. and kind of own it and be really comfortable in that space and, um, and being okay with all of that, because there are just times when you want to react, you have to put people around you who won't let you react when you want to react. And that's uh, really critical. And then listen. Oh, love. Uh-huh. Yeah. Love that. And did your did your team grow from A to B? Yeah, I think that um, I had a great team in 18, but we were all novices, right? Like, mm. we, it, in some ways, we, we all worked really hard, lots of smart folks, but everybody was very inexperienced, right. including the candidate. You know? Right, right, right. <laughs> so gotcha. um, I think that by the time we got to um, this race, um, we were we had a, a larger team a and then b all of them were more experienced and mm, so cool. i was experienced so it was a good match 
Yeah, that's awesome. So how's your race going? I mean, I'm excited about your doors today, but how's, um, how's just, it going? In general, I would say things are um, fantastic. We, um, we're running against, you know, Mr. Trumperosity. Um, and uh, <laughs> I think the more, like literally he's sending out texts saying, and I quote, uh, socialist Marie Newman is going to uh, tax you to death um, and ruin your life. So if you that, <laughs> like, it's a little hard to take you seriously, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love you, like, truly, like, flat out laughing. It's hysterical. Yeah. Um, so. Great, good. That, and that's good, like, between, like, what to um, hold and what to let go. It's great to just be like, sure, let, let that go. Because it's also like, but I'm not a socialist. I'm running as a Democrat. So what? Yeah, it's just nonsense. Um, so we at Generator, you know, we we started um, we started talking about um, started with Biden being like, you know, I'm not stoked, but I'm down. Kind of trying to meet our audience where they're at, and it's it's good, you know, rather than just being like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that, that level of honesty seems to be resonating with our audiences. Yeah. But the more we learn about his policies that he's putting out there, yeah. we're actually, I'm like getting stoked. I'm getting like genuinely stoked specifically for the climate policy that he put together with Senator Sanders and the unity task force. Yeah. Um, we'll get in, we'll get into it, but what do you think of it? I, I know that you're really I into it. Right. I think that he's made some good moves in the last six weeks. Um, and what I keep saying is, is that um, to um, whether it's young people, old people or in between is that you may not be excited about him, but it is our job to change him. That's Health right. Systems don't move unless people push them, you know? Right. And so um, I have to tell you is that I didn't have to be pushed just because I am who I am, but um, not everybody can do that. And what we, uh, what our job is, is to push him hard. So when, um, when we talk about working with the Biden camp, I'm like, well, you know, this is great and we don't agree on everything, but I think he's going to agree with me at some point. I'm pretty sure. Yep. Yep. So that's funny. We have this, like, um, we have these sort of like mini campaigns that are just like fun bite-sized things to like help us through. So one of our campaigns is vote Biden, then ride him. We got to vote him through. We just got to vote him through. That's like, it's an emergency situation right now, but then we're going to ride him, ride him to the left, ride him to the left, ride him to the left. So um, can you just talk, Marie, about how, um, I mean, let's just start here. Like, how will you hold Biden accountable? You're going to get in, into Congress. The weird texter, like te lie texter will not win. You're going to get into Congress. How are you going to hold Biden accountable? Yeah, you know, and I, I think it's more we. Certainly, I'm not going to be having a lot of one-on-one -on -one meetings with him. I can tell you that. Uh -huh. <laughs> cool. I, think that I think we can hold him accountable and just be clear that, you know, your green stimulus package, Joe, awesome. We think we can make it better and we can push it a little harder, but really good start, like awesome start, right? Um, your um, decision to only uh, build back the ACA, which honestly, and let's just all be clear, you, can, you can't fix the ACA. It's the Republicans have shredded it into bits. It is not retrievable um, and they'll never allow a true public option. And when people say, oh, but we can have Medicare for all who want it. Well, that's what we have right now. That's really what we have right now. So this isn't working. So inaction is very expensive. When there's no solution or a half solution, it actually always ends up being more expensive than a solution. Mm. So what I say is Medicare for All is an existing program. We make bigger and more robust and roll it out in a measured way so that it's ready for market, right? Um, I'm a former management consultant, so I like all of that nerdy stuff, right? So with that, what we do is tell Biden, it's like, okay, you take him to phase one with you, like grab his hand and say, we can do right, this right. together, right? We can make Medicare better and we can uh, get it to folks that are 50 plus <sighs> are vulnerable and um, not doing well. And then we can get it to everybody else. You can do this. Come on, Joe, you can do right, it. Good. Right. So, so that's an example. Yeah. So, um, and, and how do you, you know, does it help how do you tell your constituents to hold you accountable? Yeah, so we are doing something. So I'm big on um, measurement in my life, and I don't mean in competitive or that I have better hair or I have cooler clothes. It is, a, I just have goals, right? Like, so um, whenever I have a goal, I like to know where I'm at against that goal. 
So I'm going to have uh, quarterly. Accounts. I see you have an eye an eye watch, right? You must like count your steps or whatever. Duh. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, cool. <laughs> and I, I a little competition with my so yeah. um, I, you may, so I um, your audience may not know so not know Friends the, the show Friends Monica yeah. was oh you know, yeah so my husband will say that I'm like Monica times seven uh, when it comes oh to this so <laughs> problem in my life um so uh but in terms of uh, an accountability report we're going to do a quarterly accountability report so people can say okay transportation authorization bill. Uh, check. She she voted the right way. How far along in the Germans? Did she tell us that it was moving and it's not? Is it moving? You know, those types. So if we do that, then um, I can say, hey, I'm, I'm not getting as much done as I want, but this is what's getting done. This is what we have to do moving forward. And then people are just really clear on where things are at because half of this is people have no idea what's going on. And that's ridiculous. They should know at all times what, what bills are moving through the house, what effect I can have, if any, um, and if I should have more effect. Um, so as an example, I want to be on transportation and infrastructure and small business. Those are two things that I am really passionate about. Very important in my district, very important. Um, and they're going to know what my ideas are all the time. And I'm also going to ask them, what do you think of these ideas? Because I'm yeah. with you. I'm not, I'm not the only one in this mix. There's 730,000 souls in my district. I mm. want to know what you want to know. So, okay, so I want to ask you more about that and your specific policies because you have them um, like laid out so tight. But this report that you're saying, like, would that just be like on your website and people can go to their congressperson's and website? You, and there I, it is. You know, I do an e-letter and then probably uh, do figure out how to brand it in a way on social media where it is digestible, you know, where it's uh -huh. not so. so cool. That is so cool. Okay, so yeah, tell me about... Um, Tell me about the, these policies, mass transportation and um, jobs that you're looking into, and then we'll get into your your ideas for climate jobs so created by the yeah, climate economy. They're, they're intersectional, right? Is that um, so? Cool. Transportation and infrastructure intersects with the green economy, and so what we can do. So, if you're familiar with the Thrive Solution Resolution, sorry, that's out there, it takes all of the wonderful ideas in the Green New Deal and actually makes them um, into uh, kind of tactical areas that we can start to develop and create a new economy with a timeline right so sort of like is it is it the next step in the green new deal the green new yeah, deal like the action like, items yeah and excuse me i'm very warm i'm taking this off now cool um, you're getting heated you're passionate yeah, i'm loving it getting excited i'm um, also like i'm like moving around I'm like yeah I feel you. so um with the thrive resolution what that allows us to do is now convert it into an objective a strategy tactics budget timing Mm -hmm. And then we can apply it, which is the spirit of the Green New Deal, not unlike the original New Deal. In the Midwest, you're going to get this chunk of money for these projects, and we're going to prioritize greenifying, detoxifying buildings. So something mm. like 40% of our carbon footprint and the uh, toxins are related to building um, toxicity. So let's prioritize that. And then next, let's start making our transportation systems very energy efficient and safe and let's then apply all of the issues we've learned in the pandemic and make it safe for people. Mm -hmm. All of that are projects that make jobs and require workforce training um, and are applied to right. the entire nation. Mm. So how do you see that? How do you see, um, how do you see it like rolling out in Illinois and in Illinois third district? And I'm also yeah. like wondering how you fight for this let's say like the thrive resolution how you fight for this in your district versus with your state do you just go state down and then it's like you know you disseminate the information to your district or is it particular to illinois three yeah how you would do it there's two streams you need to look at so the thrive resolution obviously would be uh federal money which would be part of a stimulus package so there's cool. called the moving forward act which is a reauthorization act of surface transportation that happens every 10 years we're going to get that puppy through really fast in January or February. That'll be done. On top of that, it's like the next layer of the cake, right? And so that will be the stimulus package that has um, this mm. uh, green stimulus, um, all of these green stimulus ideas attached to it with transportation and aging infrastructure. So it makes our infrastructure cleaner, stronger, better. But when you do that, you build jobs and job training efforts so that you have sustainable economy moving forward. Um, and you do it in a way where you prioritize the most important. So in my district, you just relay it. 
in 31st Street. You know where that is, right, Alana? Of course, 31st Duh. Street. Hello, Illinois Three. It's right by the bakery, duh. Duh, um, bakery, hello. So that 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 bridge is um, not in great shape. That will get uh, prioritized monies. Similarly, there's one just that barely touches my district on, on I-80 that would get money. And then there are um, roads that need to be wow. walked by Midway Airport. And then there's an overpass by Midway. So those are things that would allow us to greenify and detoxify. And then there are buildings mm. in um, the Loop, which is our financial district, which need some help because they could be a lot cleaner, right? And then there are uh, authorizing new, uh, new construction. And what if we said, wow. okay, this new subdivision or these houses in this um, ward in the city uh, get this money if they're green, if they're green houses. And, but you only get it if you're green. Right, right, right. Yeah, Incentivizing. It's all of cool. us to move down a new path. That is so, that is so cool. And it's your, the way that you're um, talking it out is super clear and helpful and just like easy to understand. I really appreciate it. <laughs> um, so, so anybody watching tonight, I'm wondering how um, they can support you and your campaign. Oh my gosh. Well, that is so kind. Um, so we do need phone bankers. And so you can go to marienewmanforcongress.com and it's all spelled out, all uh, just words, no numbers, marienewmanforcongress.com. And they can hit volunteer and it'll take you to the mobilize uh, page and it'll allow you to sign up for any number of phone banks. And we really need that because what we're finding in days of COVID, so I'm knocking doors and some super volunteers are knocking doors, but a lot of folks are uncomfortable, right? So if you could hop on a phone bank and start um, converting independence my way, God bless babies, right? It, that's what we need to do. Um, if you cool. feel like um, you have a couple of extra shekels, if you've got five extra bucks, put it in my donation box, same place, marienewmanforcongress.com. Um, or you can send me a fun smiley picture. I'm happy with that too. Amazing, amazing. Wow. Thank you so much for joining me, Marie. I really appreciate um, you running. I know you said you had to, but I really appreciate it. I feel like safe <laughs> knowing that you're running. It makes me feel better about this country. And um, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, you bet. And you guys have a great evening. Thank you for having me. It was lovely. Thank you. My honor. Thank you. My honor. For real. Wow. That was so cool. Oh, that was really awesome, you guys. Chandra Bishop and Marie Newman, just like two people who can make Illinois um, immediately so much more um, progressive. And it's like, you know, I'm excited by that word progressive, but I don't know that everyone is, but it's like just more like um, decent for human beings to live in is really uh, what I mean. Um, so, wow, that was really inspiring and exciting. Um, okay, Chandra Bishop and Marie Newman. Um, but I'm going to bring on our final guest right now. So, um, okay. So, you know, I told you that, uh, earlier, don't tell me I didn't, I told you guys that I told you this. <laughs> that, um, so funny to just talk to nobody. Um, I also, at least I know Ryan and Vanessa are, are listening guys. I'm just trying to make you laugh desperate for, um, your approval and your laughs. Okay. Anyway. So, um, I told you before these generator lives, it's like, I, I inter interview experts to help me understand at a really basic level. And the experts are politicians and activists. And you hope, I hope, I hope that one hinges to the other, which you saw tonight with Chandra and Marie. They really are working for the same goals that activists are, which is human rights, but within the system. So um, now my final guest will be um, an activist. Uh, she is someone from an organization that here at Generator, we really, we just love this group, Indivisible. We love this group, Indivisible. Honestly, our goal at Generator, we like dream of it, is like first be a generator and then go be an Indivisible. They're just amazing. It's a network of grassroots activists all over the country, <clears throat> all over the country, excuse me, LOL. I can't tell, you know what I mean? There's no feedback or whatever. Um, this grassroots network of, uh, a network of grassroots activists millions of people, millions of people across the country. It's really like, I, I think they honestly have representation in every county. They are amazing. And they equip people with toolkits to hold their elected officials accountable. 
Um, so tonight our final guest is a super activist because she is a school teacher. And on top of that, an activist, I mean, to teach the children of this country is God's work. It's the most important work, but then to go, I mean, in COVID, oh my goodness, we got to hear how this is going for her, but she's really also a dedicated activist. She's a member of Indivisible Western Springs, and she's the head of Coalition for Change, Illinois 3 in Marie Newman's district, which is a network of Indivisibles and other progressive groups in IL3. Um, so give it up for our final guest, Abby McKinty. Hey, I don't see you yet, Abby. Where are you? There you are. Hello. Hey, Abby. Thanks so much for joining me. Hi. Of course. It's great to be here. Um, okay, first I got to ask, how's school going? Well, I have three kids. We are all remote learning, and um, I'm also teaching remotely. So, you know. Oh, my God. I'm oh actually my sitting at my, my son's desk area. I wow. it up a little. I'm like, huh? Wow. What are you doing? But it anyway. looks really good. Abby, that's amazing. How are you balancing that? Uh, well, we're all, my husband's also working for home. So really, it's just one of us yelling at the other four people to be quiet because something important is happening. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Wow. So, okay. So God bless you. That's absolutely amazing. Um, can you tell, like, can you tell our audience just what's up with Indivisible? What's the deal for anyone who's watching who doesn't know what the group does? Can you explain it a little bit and just give us a feel for what it looks like, it feels like to be a part of Indivisible? Sure. Well, uh, it is a, it was began as a national project to, you know, in the aftermath of the 2016 election to fight Trump's agenda. But as you mentioned um, early on, so much happens locally that I think a lot of us are or weren't paying attention to. Right. And it's so important that now we do pay attention carefully and closely. So that's what happened in my town. We just started meeting. Um, a few leaders took on the uh, guide that Indivisible first put out. And we just started getting people together face to face to talk about our concerns and then figure out how to actually organize behind those concerns and take mm. action. So cool. And did you join in 2016? I did. I think I was at their first meeting. <laughs> amazing. That's amazing. So, you know, at first it feels like this sort of primordial space where you're like, you're just sort of feeling it out. And I'm wondering now, after four years of organizing, do you have sort of a rhythm? Do you know how the system works enough that you're like, this is what we got to do? Or do you still have to sometimes like parse out the next steps? Well, it's very much a marathon. And I think um, we all have to be aware of that. So one thing that I think right. is important is that the passions of the individuals that make up the group really keep the drive going. So one of us might have a particular maybe local issue and the others mm -hmm. rally behind that person to um, support them, back them up, show up. I just think showing up at meetings, showing up and, and you know, again, holding our leaders accountable by saying we're all here and this is all what we want um, is wonderful. Right. And, and, you know, once that issue is maybe at a stage where it's getting resolved or things are happening, you know, it's like whack-a-mole these days. There's always something else popping up. But yeah. again, because we have a number of leaders who are all engaged and all sort of have particular interests, it's a way right. to kind of avoid burnout. Right. It kind of like must balance the rhythm of it where somebody takes the lead on like, oh, I'm so, yeah, I'm so passionate about this. And then it's like, okay, then you lead this. Cool. Right. Um, right. So we have this series cheat sheet for the voting booth because we have this live event series, these Jenny socials, these dance parties, and I'm always inviting my, you know, indivisibles to come and give me a cheat sheet. And I have some indivisibles that I'm like, hey, what's on the ballot? Can you just tell me what's up? So I want to talk about um, something that's going to be on the ballot for Illinois 3, which is the fair tax ballot proposal. Tell me what's up with this. All right, yeah, so it's gonna be the first thing you see on the ballot. The important thing to know is to vote yes for the fair, for, for the fair tax. Um, I think the important thing to understand about it is that Illinois is currently under a flat tax system. So we're all taxed at the same rate, whether or not we make $10,000 or 
you know, millions of dollars. And the problem is, is that that puts the burden of taxation on the low income earners and the middle class, if you look at um, it as a share of their of their taxes as a share of their of their overall income. So the fair tax is genuinely doing that. It is for 97% of us in Illinois, either lowering our tax rate from where it currently is or maintaining where it currently is. So only if you are making more than $250,000 a year, will you start to see a graduation. And then the highest rate uh, is for a million and up. But even that highest rate is um, less or a lower rate than you would see even in other states. So there's a lot of fear mongering of, oh, all the rich people are gonna leave and things like that. And it's like, really? Well, Iowa would tax them at a higher rate. So would Minnesota, et cetera. So if, again, for 97% of us, this is actually gonna be helpful to our families um, for you know, all the other all the other things we need to use our money for right now. So again, the 3% of those who are making more than $250,000 will slowly see a graduated rate. Um, but for the vast majority of us, this is going to help uh, generate a lot of, um, you know, dollars to help our state education, all sorts of other issues. And um, it really then allows those who are at the very top to pay their fair share. And help you live. Uh, thanks, Ryan. And just help you live. Like you just need, I, I mean, it's, 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 uh, so I just want to repeat. So fair tax proposal. Yeah, you want a fair tax. So yes, you want a fair tax. And also I'm sure Indivisible Western Springs on your Instagram, it's like all laid out and just the answer is yes. And it's just to the point of like, everyone's going to leave. They say that about New York and it's like, well, let's take the billionaire's money and, and then they'll leave. But also no, they're not. There's yeah. one Iowa, there, there's one Illinois, there's one New York. You know what I mean? People are just, they're not gonna leave. They're, they're too rich to honestly care either way. Yeah, 32 states already do it this way. So we're just joining the team. Amazing, amazing. So um, Abby, what can someone do if they want to get involved in these last crucial 40 days? How can they reach out to you, reach out to Indivisible Western Springs or Coalition um, for Change? What, what can they do? Sure. Well, I think um, Indivisible and Murray are sort of honing on what really is important right now. Again, we can't knock doors because uh, we're not doing that right now. But the, the bonus of that is that with phone banking, you can reach much further than your neighborhood. So um, Indivisible has a phone bank set up for the 2020 election. They're targeting um, Senate races and some of those swing states you were mentioning earlier. And I think what's so amazing is that we can get on the phone with someone in Georgia. We can get on right. the phone with someone um, in one of these other states. And then I know that phone banking seems a little scary, but I think uh, our stories are what really connect us. And um, I know that currently the story is RBG and that's what we're talking to voters about in those states. And I think all of us um, you know, have some sort of personal way in which her work touched our lives and that we can bring our own stories onto the phone and just make it seem a little bit simpler to connect with other people about um, making sure that you vote in November. That's awesome. Abby, thank you so much for your work for the community. And also just what a badass you are as a teacher and a mom. Thank you for your work just as an amazing woman. It's so cool. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Really appreciate it. Thank you. This is great. Thanks, Abby. Have a good night. You too. Oh, I'm filled with so much hope. <laughs> I'm so grateful um, for Pygmalion. This was so awesome. Um, so just final things I just want to say is register to vote. Holy shit, register to vote. Make a voting plan. It's not easy. It's confusing. I still am like checking, am I registered by absentee? Do I have to tear up my absentee ballot if I go in person early? It's crazy. It, you know, release the shame. I'm here with you. It's hard. Make a plan. Take the time that it takes to make that plan. If you want to do a little extra, Indivisible is amazing. And they have you know, everything um, that you could ever need uh, to phone bank. Oh my gosh, I do see this. Thank you, Pygmalion. Early voting opens today in Illinois. Yes. Oh my God. Early voting opens today. I think in New York, we only have it for like a week, October 24th. So that's like really hot. Illinois is progressive and advanced and amazing. You guys are, we're trying to catch up with you. So 
early voting opens today in Illinois. So if you want to do something extra, go to Indivisible. And I really suggest finding them on your local on Instagram and DMing them. It'll be kind of easier to um, wrangle uh, doing the volunteer work. So um, just want to reiterate, this is the most important, crucial election of our lifetime. Gen Z and millennials make up 37% of the voting bloc this year. We have the power. We, ha we are the biggest voting bloc in the country for the first time ever, our, our young of an age group. We have the power. Lord almighty, use it. Your vote counts as much as Donald Trump himself. Your vote counts as much as Jeff Bezos. That's hilarious. Just at least you know, follow through on the joke and vote. Um, and thanks for joining me tonight. I want to give it up again for Chandra Bishop, votechandra.com, uh, Marie Newman, Marie Newman for Congress, all spelled out.com. And um, Abby McKinsey is a badass and Indivisible Western Springs and Coalition for Change, Illinois 3 are um, great organizations to check out. So thank you. Thank you, Pygmalion, for continuing to exist and doing this and for having me and letting me do a generator live at your event. Really appreciate it. And um, since COVID, I've become this lady, a church lady on the street. God bless you. I'm just going to say it. May God bless you. Bye.